Want to welcome you back to Full Frame. Susan loves our music, by the way. Uh, and joining us now is Carrie Lee. She's with Live to Love International. And so the two of these uh, obviously connected, uh, know a great deal about what's going on in Nepal. We're going to continue our conversation about a country that was really hit hard, hammered by this earthquake. And Carrie, uh, I know that your people are still on the ground there, yes. still intense. Kind of give us an update because Susan makes a really good point. You know, the, this news cycle, it's 24 hours unless it's Caitlyn Jenner, and then it seems like it goes on for forever, and this important stuff tends to kind of go by the wayside. Give us an idea of a scene setter, if you will, of what's going on right now. Absolutely, and first of all, thank you to Full Frame and Susan for keeping a spotlight on Nepal. It's probably the most important thing um, for us in this development of relief work. And Susan, who has done movies about helping people die, well, she's done a lot of work on helping people live in Nepal, so that's greatly appreciated. Um, on the ground now uh, is monsoon season. We Live to Love focuses on particular communities where there are a lot of migrant workers. Um, a good chunk of Nepal's population goes abroad for work, leaving uh, women, children, and the elderly to cope with recovery. So those are the communities that we focus mm -hmm. on. Mm -hmm. um, once monsoon season is over, and I think Nepal, I'm pretty convinced that Nepal is ready to take on tourists. You know, we were first responders at one point, and now we're sort of coping with monsoon season and making sure that there isn't widespread disease and getting everyone sheltered and building up. And by the time monsoon season is over, um, we'll be ready for tourism. Let me ask both of you, and Susan, maybe you can take first crack at this. It seems to me the story is always the, the battered, you know, they're, they're battered. And I think the one story that often is missing, and I'm sure you saw it firsthand, is the resiliency of people when they're dealing with something like this. So what were some of the takeaways for you? Well, you see people sharing. I mean, when we went up into the hills, uh, uh, the nuns were so organized and they had everyone's names. And so we were meeting with all these people and they were taking care of each other and finding the people that weren't there. So I think there's a, a lot of cooperation. Um, you did see a lot of women and children. Uh, I think that, uh, you know, so that whatever the males were in the village that were still around or the young guys that hadn't gone off to work were helping taking care of, a, you know, some of the older people. Um, but I see it in the kids, too. You know, I see how much they respond to the love that Pushpa gives them, even though they've had very difficult beginnings and even though they've had um, a very difficult time surviving and have a bit of a stigma on them. They they are they are very resilient, and um, I, I I think that there have been so many plans. I mean, His Holiness came up very quickly. They were coming up with a, 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 a not just a plan, but a. Um, actual tin roofs and things to build to rebuild and how how they would shelter these people because the pressure was knowing that the monsoons were right. coming so uh, I mean it, it wasn't as if it was total chaos you know it uh, there was a lot of need and there was a lot of devastation but there were also a lot of minds that were figuring things out yeah, and the strength of the people. I mean you must have seen that as well I mean it, and, you, and you have people on the ground who see it every day I'm sure. It, it, that's absolutely right. Um, they're survivors. You know, the, the Himalayas has been critical to stabilizing that region, and it's often overlooked. And the Nepali people have given so much to the rest of the world in terms of culture and tradition and art. And now it's time, I think, that people give back to Nepal. And I've talked to people, you know, shortly after uh, the devastation about what it's like to come into an area that's been devastated by a huge earthquake or a tsunami or, or whatever. And that, that rebuilding stage is, is so lengthy. And as you said, the spotlight goes off. Um, any idea how long it's going to take the, for Nepal to get back up on its feet? Because this person was saying one of the things that you hope for anytime you go into a situation like that is a really strong infrastructure. And, and in Nepal, they're, they, it's not as strong as you'd like. So I'm sure that adds to the layers of complexity. So what was your sense coming away, Susan? Um, well, I think, you know, I think that there are a lot of individual groups that are helping in very real ways. I mean, look how long it took us to deal with Ground Zero. And that was bureaucracy and some corruption and everything else, you know. And, uh, and, and what I saw there was that the, 
the difference was made by individuals who were going out when I was down there for months and months. There are individuals going out and getting pizzas and, you know, before anything could come in. And I think that that's the strength of Nepal also is that they're not waiting for the top to come and do it. There are all these on the ground people that have have very quickly and very efficiently found ways to deal uh, and to build. And, and like I said, you know, one of my jobs was shopping. I took the nuns <laughs> shopping be, to go to these really cool little crafty places and stuff because we wanted people to see that there's a lot that's still up. It's not, there's hotels and there are restaurants and, you know, a, th there was a lot of devastation. I mean, you can't minimize that and there is a great need for money to keep coming in, but it's also, uh, it's important not to just write it off. You know, I think Susan's hitting on something that's really important, and we saw this with Haiti, where, it, you know, these big institutions come in and they're gonna do everything. It, it really takes the people, it takes this collaboration for it to work right. And but even in Haiti, like, the money didn't get spent right, by a lot right. of these big groups. Yeah. And, uh, Artists for Peace and Justice that I work with in Haiti built a high school over the years since the earthquake and have gotten in there and done things. And again, it's, you know, you, if you, you can't go into a place, anytime you're trying to do help, you have to have a really good relationship with the people that live there. You have to understand the culture. Exactly. You have to understand how to get things to them, not only physically, but psychologically you know you can't just go in and be big and bulky and and then I find that there's you know I saw one of the big agencies that I won't mention but they were staying in the best hotel they were all eating these great lunches while everyone else was scurrying around in Nepal and uh, so I always say if you want to help find the groups that are in there that have the history that and see what they do and investigate where you're putting your money and that's why I stand behind this group and push but because I know you know there's not a lot of overhead I know that they know what they're doing I know that the money goes there uh, and that's really important if you want to help and one of the things you're advocating is tourism I mean you know like and and Carrie you had a chance to chat with me about this too I mean it's, yes it's it's hit but as you mentioned you know hotels are still there it's it's a good time to go back that's the lifeblood of, of that country yes. in many respects yeah. it's really important that people support it in that way as well absolutely yeah and and you see this as critical as well I do. I do. You know, it's, it's not just about getting first aid. Um, it's not just about rebuilding buildings. It's about empowering the people to have a livelihood and empowering the uh, economies that need to be jump-started again. And this is a great opportunity also to empower women and children who haven't had economic opportunities before to be able to have a fresh start and partake um, in, in the new economies that are going to rise. Yeah, that's come a, back that's even a stronger. Good, uh, uh, yeah, come back in a different way than there's been and actually see this as a rebirth of new ideas and better ideas. You know, sometimes when things have to fall apart to be rebuilt in a more interesting way, at least that's what I'm hoping as I look at everything falling apart <laughs> um, and here too, uh, that it gives you a chance to regroup, to reboot, to rethink. And uh, that's a great point, that you can start all these uh, little industries for women and that have been so successful in so many countries. Susan knows how to sift through and find organizations like right. yours. Uh, what's your suggestion to people out there who may be watching and, and want to actually connect with the right kind of organization? You know, I believe in investing in NGOs that are flexible on the ground and that are already part of the indigenous fabric. So Live to Love has been in Nepal since inception. Um, we're a big part of the Himalayan community. You can learn more about us at livetolove.org, but also keeping the spotlight on Nepal, keeping engaged in what's going on, and um, keeping the awareness wheel going is very important. And Susan, you gave, you went, you were there, you were on the ground, but but you get as well when you leave there. What are some of the takeaways, the, the lasting images or things that stay with well, you? Well, I, I, first of all, I'm moved by everybody that helps. I'm moved by th the way the communities bond together. I'm moved by Pushpa and the kids and how, you know, in the, in the face of everything else, these kids are so hopeful. It's so easy in the world today to lose faith because the stories that get all the all of the heat are horrible stories and the worst of humankind and the worst of uh, greed and selfishness and everything else and so when you go to a place and you see people and it's funny because for instance in New York and I'm born and bred New Yorker 
the same people that you see building houses for Habitat and Humanity were down at ground zero. I mean, it's the community of bad guys is all the same and the community of good guys is all the same. And, and I think that really it's so selfish to get involved in these things because it gives you hope at a time when that's really uh, difficult to have sometimes when you pick up the paper and everything's so overwhelming. And so I came back just feeling like I'd been to a different world where I wasn't so important and people were giving everything they had and, and joyfully. You know, I think the misconception that people have about do-gooders, every country I've ever been in, they're just the most passionate, happiest, most celebratory. I mean, His Holiness is laughing all the time in the face of everything. And so something must fill you up from, from having a connection, a passionate connection with your country, with something that you believe in, and with being able to see that you affect even one life, you know, and turn someone around and give them uh, options that they never would have had uh, with just a little bit of money too or just a little bit of time uh, to empower these people that are, are, are doing it the real way. I mean, I'm just a little dilettante compared to what people that really dig in and do these things all the time. But um, I left feeling empowered. I left feeling grateful that I could be part of it, just being very, very grateful for um, all the support that the nuns, my posse, the nuns yes. were great, these young women that just glow because they're connected to what they want to be connected to, and of course His Holiness and Pushpa and the kids. So I came back. Um, I hadn't slept at all. I was completely turned around. Seriously, I was on the verge of hallucinations, I think, but <laughs> I never slept and I never felt tired. Mm. I really just, you know, it's a big trip and you're completely in the wrong day or something yeah. in 15 minutes. Like it's a day in 15 minutes or something crazy. Well, I just saw the Kung Fu Nuns yesterday and by way of background, um, Live to Love has on-ground partners. We call them unofficially the Kung Fu Nuns. They're the nuns of the Drukpa order and traditionally in the Himalayan region, nuns were subservient to men and didn't have much of a leadership role. His Holiness the Gyalwang Drukpa, who um, Susan has been referring to, decided to empower these women to take leadership roles. And unfortunately, more conservative pockets were quite upset, and these nuns um, bear the brunt of a lot of acts of violence. His Holiness the Gyalwang Drukpa thought long and hard on what to do and whether it was time to back down, but decided instead to train these nuns in the art of kung fu, <laughs> which, um, which also gave them a lot of physical self-confidence. And now they're local role models in their villages and communities. They've um, traveled the world and did demonstrations at Olympic Park, at Oxford University. But the great part was they've now, since we've invested, since the lineage and His Holiness and the community invested in empowering these nuns and, and giving them a sense of confidence, they felt strong enough to be first responders and they're the ones that are river rafting supplies to the most remote villages. Mm -hmm. It's a great example of what women can do in this region. They've been traditionally overlooked, and now they're paying it forward. Well, we've got two great women here thank growing you. that community of good guys, and it's good to see you. And thank you both for coming <laughs> thank on you and for having sharing us. your stories. Really appreciate it.